Have you ever tried living by faith? I learned the hard way that it is one thing to talk about faith, teach faith, preach faith, but brother, it is a whole different ball game to start living by faith. It is downright scary. But I discovered that as I learned how to trust God, living by faith can also be an exhilarating experience. Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Dave Reagan, the founder of this ministry. I established it 41 years ago in 1980. I'm scheduled to step aside and turn the leadership of the ministry over to my successor on June the 1st, at which time I will move my office to my home and focus on writing books and articles for the ministry's magazine. I also plan to spend a lot of time praying for the ministry's future. Counting the Days program, I have only three programs left in which I will be serving as host. So, I thought I would devote today's program to what I learned about living by faith over the past 41 years with the hope that I might be able to give you some insights about how to trust God for all the needs of your life. The first book I wrote after establishing this ministry was this one titled, Trusting God. The subtitle, Learning to Walk by Faith. It is now in its third edition. It's still going strong. The most common comment I receive about it is, you had me laughing on one page and crying on the next. Our announcer will tell you at the end of the program how you can get a copy of this book that tells the history of its uh, the development of this ministry. Now, I'm going to talk to you for a moment about how we got this ministry started. The story began in 1959 when I graduated from the University of Texas in Austin with a major in government and history. I uh, had, was worn out when I graduated. I had gone night, day, weekends, summertime, and I was just burned out. So, I couldn't make up my mind whether I wanted to go to graduate school or law school, and I decided to just lay out for a year and rest, work for my dad who had a construction company, and decide what I wanted to do about my future. Well, through a bizarre series of circumstances that I describe in this book, I ended up within about three weeks after graduation being the pastor of a small country church in Grosbeck, Texas of all places. And boy was that a baptism of fire. I had two huge families who were members of this church, and they didn't like each other. They sat on separate sides of the church, and, and I had to always try to, to manage that situation. I would go over on Saturday and work with the young people, and then on Sunday morning I had to do everything, because nobody in the church would do anything. So, I had to lead the prayers. I had to do the communion service. I had to lead the singing, yes me, and then I'd do the preaching. So, it was really quite an experience. And I knew in my heart that God had called me into the ministry. But unlike Isaiah who said, Here am I, Lord, send me, I said, Here am I, Lord, send anybody but me, because I had my own mind made up that I was going to be either a diplomat or I was going to be uh, a politician. And I had decided I'd probably go to law school. Well, while I was dealing with all that, about the middle of that year I got a letter saying that I had been nominated for a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. I didn't even know what that was. I was called to Austin, Texas. I was interviewed by five professors. The next thing I knew I had the scholarship, and it was an amazing scholarship. It paid for all of my college, uh, uh, all my expenses. I could go anywhere I wanted because not only did they pay all my expenses, but they gave the college $10,000 a year just for accepting me each year, which was about worth about $50,000 a day. So, I selected Harvard University, and I went to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and earned two, three degrees, two master's degrees, and a Ph.D. in international politics. And then I began a career in academics, teaching uh, international law and politics, and also serving in administrative capacities. Now, it was while I was doing that, I was very successful at it, but I was miserable absolutely miserable. And you know why? Because I was outside the will of God. As long as I was outside His will it didn't matter what I accomplished, I found no fulfillment in it, and I was miserable. And so, even I, I even won a, a Fulbright Fellowship that enabled me to go to the Philippines and teach at the University of the Philippines in 1966 and 67, uh, but I was not happy. And when I got back God put me through a very 
difficult situation that I describe in the book. I mean, he hit me over the head with a two by four to get my attention, and he got my attention. And when he got my attention, I really went to my knees in prayer. I had just accepted a position as Vice President of University in Oklahoma. I had not moved my family up there yet. I was living in an apartment. God engineered that because He wanted to get me alone to get my, my undivided attention. And each morning I would have a devotional before I went to work. And one morning I was having that devotional and all of a sudden the Lord spoke to my heart as clearly as if He had spoken out loud. Right in the middle of my prayer He said, Step out in faith, give up your career, start preaching the soon coming of Jesus, preach, flee from the wrath that is to come by fleeing into the loving arms of Jesus. And I thought, where in the world did that come from? The next morning I'm praying, and same thing, same message step out in faith, give up your career, start preaching the soon coming of Jesus. I, I was just awestruck. I didn't know what to do. And so I kept wrestling with that and wrestling with it. I got my mail early in the mornings at that place. And one morning I went out while I was wrestling with that, and there was a package from a friend in Houston, Texas. And in it was a, a cassette tape. And it was, I found out later it was one of seven put out by Pat Robertson about decision making. And this friend had a note in there that said, I heard this tape and God said, send it to you. <laughs> so I went right back in and listened to it. And the fundamental per, uh, uh, point of that tape was, whenever you're trying to make a major decision, seek the confirmation of two or more witnesses, a principle of the Old Testament. So, I sat down and made a list of people that I might contact. And the first one I contacted was the godliest man I knew in Dallas. I called him. I told him what I thought the Lord was calling me to do. I told him I was scared to death. Uh, I didn't know how I could uh, I make, uh, pay my bills if I just gave up my career and stepped out in faith. I asked him to pray about it and call me back in two days and tell me. In two days he called back and he said, Brother, you better sit down. I said, why? He said, the morning you called me I went to a prayer breakfast. I told the people about the message God had laid on your heart. And he said, David, before they left that morning I didn't even even ask them for anything. They just voluntarily put pieces of paper in front of me, and they had monthly pledges that add up to $800 a month in pledges if you will step out in faith and start this ministry. Scared me to death. <laughs> I, 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 I sat down and I thought, okay, uh, well, I got to get a second witness. And I went through it all and I thought, well, I'll, I'll call this one lady in, in Dallas who has been a, a thorn in my side, a burr under my saddle. Uh, she was a lady who every time I preached anywhere she would get a copy of it, she would analyze it, she would send me three or four typewritten pages telling me I should have said this, I should have said that, I should have quoted this Scripture, I shouldn't have quoted that Scripture. She was just a thorn. And I, I, I'm telling you, I, I thought, well, if anybody will tell me the truth she will. Looking back on it now, I think what I was doing is trying to find somebody who would say no. So, I called her. And she said, she, she was a very abrupt lady. I called her and, and she would always answer the phone by saying, what do you want? She wouldn't say hello. She said, she said, what do you want? And I said, well, this is Dave and I'm calling. And I told her what I was all about. And she would never say goodbye. She'd just hang up. So, I told her, I said, I want you to call me back in a couple of days and let me know what you think. Pray about it. And she said, okay, and hung up. And that was it. And I thought, well, that's the end of that. The next day she called and she said, David, I I, I've been in prayer. She was so calm and so quiet, and I was scared me. She said, I've been in prayer, and David the Lord has really confirmed this in my heart. In fact, he said, right after I talked to you, I went to the mailbox, and I opened up an envelope, and I had an inheritance of $3,000. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Give a thousand to David, and I'm giving you a thousand of mine. And this was a lady who lived in poverty. But she said, I'm, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars. And then she said, And then I got another gift, and she started laughing. I didn't even know she could laugh. And I said, well, what's going on? She said, well, I know that you have an old broken down car, don't you? And I said, yeah, well, I do. And she said, well, I know you need one. And, and she said, I've got one that I'd like to, no, she said, I know you've got a university car. And I said, that's right. She said, well, I want to give you a car. I said, I know you need one. And she kept laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? She said, well, it's been on the side of the road more than it's been on the road. Said, it's a holy car. It's been prayed over many times. Well, it, it was a holy car. But she said, I'm going to give you $1,000 and your car. And folks, that got my attention. So, I stepped out in faith. I resigned my position there. I started this ministry. And when I went to the president of the university and I told him that I was going to do this, he said, well, what church are you going to uh, preach at? I said, no church. I, no church has called me. He said, you don't have a church calling? I said, no. I'm just going to step out in faith. He said, You're going, what are you going to preach? I said, Jesus is coming soon. And I remember he looked at his desk and he looked back up at me and he said, when are you going to do this? I said, I'll give you two weeks notice. On April the 1st I'm resigning. He looked down at his desk again. He looked back up at me and he said, all I can say to you is you've selected a very appropriate date, April Fool's Day. Well, I stepped out in faith and people said I was crazy. All my friends said I was crazy. 
My wife wondered if I was crazy. But we struggled through that first year. And one year later, one year later, on the exact date that we founded the ministry, on April the 1st, I arrived back into this nation from my first trip to Israel with a group. I had been to Israel before, but this is the first group I took. And my wife met me at the airport and handed me a package all wrapped up with a bow on it. And I said, well, honey, this is not our anniversary. It's not my birthday. What is this? She said, open it. I opened it. And here was this wonderful certificate that she had arranged for me. It had our logo at the top and it said, presented to my husband on the first anniversary of Lamb and Lion Ministry. And then at the bottom she had the verse from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 4 verse 10. A verse that says, we are fools for Christ's sake. That's one of my most precious possessions that hangs in my office to this day. Well, I want to tell you something folks, it was hard to start a ministry in 1980, very hard. That was before the internet. We didn't have access to the internet till 1995. Today you can start a ministry and be very successful very quickly if you have something worthwhile to say. But back in those days there was no internet. There was no way to get uh, 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 exposure. I, I, I think I preached for four or five years at just little country churches that hardly had 40, 50 members. But the Lord was using that to develop me and to develop my message. And so uh, finally I got a breakthrough and I began to preach at larger churches. But the first seven years of the ministry were extremely difficult. We prayed like mad every day to, to be able to, to meet the, the, the requirements of the ministry, the financial requirements. I, uh, the first seven years I lived on a salary of $1,000 a month because we, we just put everything we could back into the ministry and equipment and, and, and staff members. And uh, we, I lived on my wife's salary as a first grade teacher. But finally in 1987 the turnaround came. And in 1987 the ministry, the trustees asked me to take a, a sabbatical for a year and not to do any preaching. Up to that time I was holding 40 meetings a year. And they said, no meetings. I said, how are we going to finance the ministry? We said, we don't know, but God will supply. And God supplied. And one of our supporters came up with the Prophecy Partner concept. And we introduced that. And people signed up and began to send $25 a month all over this nation. And we made it through that year with no financial difficulty whatsoever. And during that year I wrote two books, Trusting God, and I wrote this book called Christ in Prophecy Study Guide. And these two books have been two of the most popular books of this ministry has ever uh, published. They're both in their third editions now. They're both still going strong. And so as a result of that I decided to cut my number of meetings in half uh, from 40 to 20 in 1988 and to start focusing upon uh, doing uh, writing. And then as the ministry moved along we finally got on the internet. We were able to develop a website and uh, I was able to begin thinking about greater outreach. Finally in 2002 we made a major decision to leave our radio program which had been going on for, for almost 21 years, a daily 15 minute radio program which had blessed so many people and had blessed me. And we instead went to television. That was a major decision. And many people got very upset about the fact that we canceled our radio program, but we couldn't do both. So we began to broadcast and we've been broadcasting ever since then. In fact I think this is uh, our about our 997th uh, program that we're broadcasting. So we've been really blessed over the years through television and the viewers who have lined up as prophecy partners and helped us. Now, we're going to take a break, and after the break we're going to take a, uh, for a break for a brief announcement. And when we return I'm going to begin to tell you about how living by faith is so exhilarating, and how God performed miracle after miracle after miracle both in the lives of people and also in the finances of this ministry. He was so faithful to us, and He worked through our prophecy partners and others to see to it that all our needs were met. July 17th Lamb & Lion Ministries will host our annual Bible Conference. The theme will be The Power of Prophecy, A Voice Crying in the Wilderness. Our special lineup of speakers includes Bob Russell, the acclaimed former pastor of one of the nation's largest churches, Alan Franklin, a British journalist who connects Bible prophecy to today's current events, Nathan Jones, our ministry's internet evangelist and co-host of our television program, me, Tim Moore, the new director of the ministry and host of Christ in Prophecy, and Dr. David Reagan, the founder of Lamb and Lion Ministries. We will be recognizing and celebrating Dr. Reagan's 41 years of dedicated service. Special music will be provided by the Purple Hulls, a high energy bluegrass sister duo. The conference will be held at the Courtyard by Marriott in Allen, Texas, a suburb just north of Dallas. 
The registration for this conference is only $10. For further details and to register, please visit our website at lamblion.com. We look forward to seeing you in July. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Dave Reagan, the founder of this ministry, and I've been reminiscing about 41 years of ministry. As I began to learn how to trust God and lean on Him for all the needs of this ministry, I began to experience miracles that surprised me and blessed me and resulted in greater and greater faith. I had grown up in a church that taught what theologians call cessationism. Basically this is a belief that when the last apostle died the gifts of the Spirit together with miracles ceased. So we basically put God in a box and said there were things He could no longer do. When I started living by faith I quickly discovered that this theology was simply not true. And I discovered three scriptures that proved it was not true. The first was Malachi 3.6 and it reads, I the Lord do not change. Uh, and that uh, uh, word Lord there is Yahweh speaking of our Creator God. He does not change. That means He can do all the things today that we read about in the Bible including the performance of miracles. The second scripture is in 1 Corinthians 1.7 and that particular scripture reads as follows. It says, you are not lacking any gift awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that all the spiritual gifts will continue until the Lord returns. And the third scripture is in Hebrews 13.8 and it's really my favorite. And it simply says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes, even forever. Jesus does not change. So, the miracles and the, and the gifts that we read about in the Bible are still relevant for today. And I learned that as I began to uh, move forward in this ministry. I began seeing miracles of God and I realized that we had pretty well defined miracles out of existence. Uh, most people say, well, a miracle is something that violates the law of nature. Well, that's true. But it can also be a miracle of timing. And I saw miracles of timing once, you know, one after another after another, as well as uh, miracles that seem to violate laws of nature. I'll explain to you. For example, one of the first miracles that uh, I experienced was early in the ministry, about 1983. I was holding a meeting here in the Dallas area, and the song leader was a man who was very spiritual in nature, and he had one child, a little girl who was about 12 years old. She had never been able to walk, never been able to talk. Uh, they would put her on a pallet at the back of the church, and she would just lie there on the pallet. And there were certain songs that she really liked, and if they sang those songs, she would get very agitated. And the doctor had told his wife he, she could never have another child because of the trauma that she experienced in delivering this girl. Well, when I offered the invitation that evening he put down the songbook, motioned to somebody else, they came up and they started leading the worship. And he and his wife came up and they said, you preach this evening uh, on Hannah and how through her faith she was able to conceive. I said, that's right. They said, well, we believe in faith that my wife can conceive because we believe in miracles regardless of what the doctors have told us. So, we just held hands and I prayed a very simple prayer that God would bless her womb. And about uh, three months later he called me on the phone. You could have heard him talking all the way across Dallas without a phone. He was so excited. He said, my wife is pregnant. The doctors don't believe it, but she's pregnant. Then he called about two months later and said, you're not going to believe this. We're going to have twins. And shortly after that their girl died. And so, God replaced that little girl with two boys, twins. And that was the first womb I prayed for. And God gave me a special gift to do that. And I prayed for womb after womb after womb since then. And I have a whole drawer full of photographs of children that were born to women who were told they could never have a child. Well, another miracle I experienced that uh, really uh, violates the laws of nature as far as I'm concerned was in the singer that uh, came to begin to sing on our program, a man by the name of Jack Hollinsworth. A man so enthusiastic about the Lord that he couldn't stand still. We called him Jumpin' Jack. And he's gone on to be with the Lord now. Many of you saw him on our program for many years. But Jack lived on the streets for 20 years as an alcoholic. Just lived in an alcoholic days. Tried to kill himself two times. Uh, uh, did not succeed because God had a purpose for his life. 
And one day he met a little lady in Lexington, Kentucky, who uh, was running a detox center there. And he started trying to, to con her. And she looked at him, and she was a real tough little lady. Her nickname was, was uh, Shotgun because she was only four foot ten. And, and she looked at him and she said, Let me tell you something, buddy, you can't con me. And she put her finger in his face and said, Let me tell you something else. I say to you, in the name of Jesus, you will never be able to get drunk again. And he laughed and said, Lady, you're talking to a professional drunk. A week later he came back and he said, You know, I've been drinking nonstop ever since you said that to me. Nonstop. And I can't get drunk. I just can't get a high. Tell me more about that Jesus. She did. He accepted Jesus. They later got married, formed a ministry called Acts 29, went all over this country ministering. You talk about a miracle. Brother, that's a miracle. And God performs those miracles every day in the lives of people all over this world. And then there were the financial miracles that we uh, encountered in this ministry, one after another. After, uh, the very first one I remember, and, and you won't think this is a miracle, but to me it was a miracle. And that was about the third year of the ministry I went to our Board of Trustees and I said, look, the car I'm driving, is it breaks down, it spends more time on the side of the road than it does on the road. I've got to have a new vehicle so I can drive to all the meetings I'm preaching at. And they said, fine. And they voted unanimously, go buy a new uh, vehicle. We moved on to the next item on the agenda, and suddenly one of the trustees said, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, let's talk about this for a moment. He said, How are you going to uh, get that car? I said, Well, I'll do it the way I've always done. I'll go down, and I'll find a, a new economical car, and I'll sign a contract, and we'll start paying so much a month. He said, I don't think you should do that. He said, David, this is a faith ministry. You've said that from the beginning, and you've got to learn to live by faith. He said, if, if you have a need, God knows it's a need. If it's a legitimate need, God will supply it. Don't do it that way. Just simply let's join hands around this table and pray that God will supply that vehicle. And then let's wait for God to supply it. I said, okay. So we joined hands. We prayed. In the next little newsletter, which was just a one-page newsletter at that time, I put a little paragraph in there and said, we need a, a, a van for the ministry that we can use to carry our materials in when we go to a meeting. We sent that out, and about three days later, a lady from Oklahoma City who I met only one time, I preached at her church, she called me and she said, I saw you need a van. How much does a van cost? I said, Well, it costs about, oh, I'd say $15,000. This was back in the 1980s. And she said, Well, uh, how much do, uh, does the uh, tax title and license cost? I said, I don't know. She said, Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make the check out for $17,000. I'll send it to you by overnight mail. Bang, just like that. We had the money. Sure was a lot better than borrowing it from a bank. And I just saw that happen over and over. And I, my faith began to build. I, I remember when we began broadcasting on TV, we were on one national network, the Daystar Network. And, and we broadcast on that for about a year, a year and a half. And one day a man from Houston called and said, I'd like to see you get this program on another national network. I said, well, I agree. We've been praying about that for a long time. He said, well, uh, what would it cost? I said, I don't know, but it, uh, probably about $150,000 a year. He said, well, great. He said, I'm going to send you a check for that amount right now, and you get on that second network. And, and, and I was just blown away. But let me tell you something else about that. Uh, after he did that, it suddenly occurred to me, well, does that network have a, a, a space for us? So, I called the network and I asked to speak to the Vice President of Programming. And he gets on the phone and I said, my name is Dave Reagan. I'm with Lamb and Line Ministries. We have this television program. He said, I know all about that. He said, are you calling in response to my letter? And I said, well, uh, no, this was before now, you know, uh, he had actually sent me a letter. It was before we were relying on, on the internet that much. And so, uh, I said, no, I haven't gotten your letter. He said, well, I sent you a letter the other day. My wife's been using your materials to teach her class for five years, and she's been bugging me to death to get your program on our network uh, ever since you started broadcasting about a year and a half ago. And he said, we've got an opening, and I sent you a letter and told you so. I said, well, that's a confirmation from God. And the next thing I knew we were broadcasting on that station. Folks, I have seen this happen over and over and over. I remember one time uh, uh, the, uh, we never ended a month without having all our bills paid. Never in the history of this ministry. All our bills paid every month. Never gone into debt. And so, one month the, the financial director came to me and he said, David, I hate to tell you this, but I think we're going to have our first month when we don't have all our bills paid. So, we went to prayer and we began to pray day after day after day that the Lord would get us to the end of the month with all our bills paid. And the end of the month came and the next day he came in and he said, well, David, we made it. 
we got $7.50 left in the bank. <laughs> and I, I praise the Lord for that. And then a few days later, well, somebody came to my office and said, there's a dentist who has moved here from Florida. He's been watching our program. He ordered all of our TV programs. He wants to talk to you. I went in. I talked to him for about 30 minutes. He looked at his wife. He said, we've got to go. He said, before we go, let's give him, give him a check. He said, uh, do you think 25 would be fine? And she said, yes. And he wrote the check, handed it to me, walked out to his car. I went over and handed it to my secretary and went to my office. The secretary said, David, did you look at this check? I said, yeah, I looked. Uh, no, I said, I didn't look at it. Uh, it's for $25. She said, no, this check is for $25,000. Folks, we just had things like that happen over and over and over. God was so faithful, He always met all our needs. And again, I could just tell you story after story after story of how God was faithful to us, how He met every need that we had in this ministry, and how we always finished every year uh, every month with our bills paid. We also, uh, one of the rules of the ministry was never to go into debt. So, when we got ready to build a building, we would raise enough for the foundation, we would pour it, I would take a photograph of it, put it in, the, uh, in our magazine, and say, now we are ready for walls, and tell them how much more we needed. When we got that, we built the walls. Then we say, okay, we are ready to put a roof on it and do the inside. Tell them how much, we would get that, we would do it. By the time we got through with every building, every building was paid for in full. And so, today our ministry stands completely debt free, we don't owe money on building, we don't owe money on equipment, and this was because we had a trust, group of trustees who truly were men of faith who taught me a lot of lessons about how to live with faith. And I challenge you to reach out to God when you have a need because God is a personal God, He loves you, and He will respond to your need. You just test Him and you will see. God bless you. I hope you'll be back with us next week when my colleagues Nathan Jones and Tim Moore will be with me to discuss why we believe we are living in biblical times. You know, the idea for next week's program came to me when I was having lunch with a friend, and as we were discussing the first coming of Jesus, he suddenly said, David, wouldn't it have been thrilling to have lived in biblical times? And I responded by saying, Brother, we are living in biblical times. Next week, we will explain what I meant by that statement. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. The third edition of Dr. Reagan's book, Trusting God, Learning to Walk by Faith, has just been published and is available for a donation of $20 or more. That includes the cost of shipping. The most common response we have received to this book over the years has been an emotional one. It had me laughing one moment and crying the next. In anecdotal form, Dr. Reagan tells a story of his wrestling match with God that led him to surrender his academic career and enter full-time ministry, dedicating his life to proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. In the process, he explores central questions of life that confront people on a daily basis. And with each copy ordered, we will supply you with a copy of Colonel Tim Moore's new 48-page booklet titled, Looking Forward to the Reign of Jesus Christ. This booklet explains why Tim has a premillennial view of end-time prophecy and why it matters. Just ask for offer number 957. You can place your order through our website at lamblion.com or by calling the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. Again, you can place your order through our website or by calling the number you see on the screen. Just ask for offer number 957. You can be assured that these materials will be a great blessing to you in understanding God's prophetic word. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 